Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Armor Podcast. I'm your host Lefarius, and for this week we're going to be taking a look at Sperris Legacy. But as always, before we jump into that, let's have a look at this week's news. Now the first thing I noticed is that the Digitizer 2000 Kickstarter fund is going quite well. Uh, they basically added another stretch goal about a, a week ago now, which basically says that the £60,000 level they will let Amiga owners have their revenge after 25 years, is it? Almost. Good God, I don't know what that's going to involve. He hasn't really uh, gone into the detail on that yet, but it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, last I checked, it was at about £36,000, £37,000, so it's growing there slowly. As always, I'll stick a link in the show notes. Uh, next up, that's some awesome bit of news actually, I noticed on uh, Indie Retro News, but basically there's a re-release of Simon the Sorcerer, uh, one and two in like a, a double pack. Now, from what I could see of the details, it features new gameplay controls, uh, hot spots, so no more pixel hunting. That was quite a, a picky problem with the first one because you really had to search the screen just to find some of the solutions. New icons, uh, new animations, new game menus, better saving and loading. Also, HD graphics mode, which upscales the game to much higher resolutions. I'm actually quite excited about that. I think it's about £10 at the moment but uh, they don't seem to have confirmed the price yet but it's out on April the 3rd uh, one of my favourite point and clicks the original especially with the voice work that's all included and all been like digitally I don't know is it remastered or clean up it's not new voice actors or anything like that I'm actually quite looking forward to it because it's been absolutely years since I played the uh, the Simon games uh, next bit of news I noticed uh, basically over on Atari Age someone has, has come up this you might be thinking why oh my god why is he mentioning Atari games on uh, uh, an Amiga podcast well basically because somebody's gone ahead and reprogrammed a version of Stunt Car Racer, which is an absolute classic Amiga game, which caught me attention straight away. And they've put it onto the 8-bit Atari XL-XE. It's not something I'm familiar with, but I think it was more maybe an American system, but it was an 8-bit computer anyway. But apparently, just reading through some of the blurb, uh, it, it's, it's got all the features of the Commodore 64 version with an improved frame rate, uh, music, rich sound effects plus it's PAL and NTSE compatible so it'll work on uh, both sides of the ocean. Now I'd just like to take a moment to uh, thank all my Patreon supporters. As always the list is growing, the wall is growing and it's uh, great for people to actually offer something because you know I, I do do this for free, I don't expect anything for it so it really is appreciated. So uh, yeah, fantastic thank you to you all. Uh, as usual, if you want to have a look at any gameplay video of the upcoming episode or leave some comments or emails, just pop over to uh, AmigaRama.com. And with that, it's time to move on to this week's game. Now, for this week, I've gone and picked Sperris Legacy. Now, this was a bit of a funny one because uh, as I was looking at various titles to choose, I mean, I tend to just like hit a pile of games and then pick out something I think will be interesting to talk about. But I really wanted to cover something like uh, an RPG where it was uh, maybe a bit more platformy, a bit more uh, action involved. And, you know, when you start looking through the Amiga library, you know, I was thinking more along the lines of like a Zelda type game, that sort of stuff. And there's loads of platformers, there's loads of sports game strategy, you name it. But when it comes to stuff like this, there's very, very, very few, especially from uh, uh, back in the day. So this one definitely stood out, especially when I realised that Team 17 were behind it. So uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it. It was published by Ocean and Team 17, which seems to happen quite a lot for both of them. I could go through a list of their games, but I'm pretty sure you know who those guys are involved with. Uh, developed by a company called Binary Emotions. Now, they did a small number of games at the time. I'll go into them in a bit more detail when we get around to the coding part. Now, it re was released uh, an AGA version in 1995, so this is pretty late in the Amiga's life, uh, with a CD 
3D32 version released later, I think with a better uh, uh, music, uh, in 1996. I mean, by God, by this point, the Amiga was pretty much dead because the 32 come out in 94, I think, 93, 94. God, yeah, we were well into like the PlayStation and uh, N64 eras. Uh, it came on four discs, uh, single player only. Now, the coders behind this were a guy called Clive Minican and Phil Bogue Butcher. Now, uh, Phil has been actually involved in quite a lot of uh, decent Amiga titles. Uh, uh, Putty Squad is probably the most popular. Uh, Premier Manager 3. Uh, and Clive was, I don't know why, but he was only involved in uh, the Mini Skies games. There was only a, a couple of them. So that between, you know, one of them did a, a fair chunk. Clive, not as many, but... But yeah, so I don't know why they got involved with Team 17 at this point, and I couldn't really find any from, from the history, I'm afraid. Uh, the music in the game was was shared between uh, Phil, um, Ian Ford, Ian Jolly, and Keith Baker. Uh, again, uh, looking at the music, these guys were all mixed in. A fair few of them uh, did the stuff for Mini Skies as well. Uh, I mean, this itself, I mean, it, it's clearly a clone of the uh, the Legend of Zelda. I mean, when you start the game off, the main character is, is pretty much lying in bed at night, uh, and then the story kicks in with you getting up and stuff. So it, it's obvious what they were trying to do. And the style of the game, it's a top-down action RPG. You know, it pretty much looks identical to Zelda with the uh, with the weapons and the items and the, the menu stuff, and it pretty much controls similar as well. Now, I did discover that uh, Phil Bogue Butcher actually posts on the uh, EAB forum, that's the English Amiga boards if you're not aware, uh, and then looking into some of the comments he made about this game some time ago, uh, he basically said that, because uh, he was one of the coders, but at the time he said they made a mistake of starting on the AGA version first. Uh, because they realised by the end of it that the game was just too big, uh, and then having to switch it back to uh, A500, no OCS, ECS versions, they would have to like strip out loads. And another problem is the loading times would have been absolutely huge, so it just didn't happen. Now, one of the things he he, he did talk about as well, just uh, on a side comment, because he was behind uh, 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 Premier Manager 3, I think it was the Deluxe Edition, uh, but he was boasting about that at the same time, saying that even to this day that the uh, copy protection he wrote for it still hasn't been cracked. So if that's a challenge to everybody, that's still knocking about there, anybody. Now, the coders between them all made didn't make much money on this at all. They were all given a, a £4,000 advance, uh, but it barely made that much money back, which might might seem a bit odd with it being a Team 17 game. But if you think at the time, uh, uh, Worms was released roughly about this same time, and as a company, Team 17 were pushing all the marketing stuff and then making that the uh, the main draw for consumers, as it were. And, and as you know, what happened with that, it went on to be a massive, massive hit and earned him an absolute fortune. I mean, at the time, from what I could gather, I think Team 17 were struggling a bit, despite being behind so many good games. I think maybe they did uh, might have expanded a bit too quickly or a bit too much. But uh, this game just this game just seemed to come along at the right time and get them out of uh, a sticky situation. Now, from what I could work out, there was a sequel in mind. I mean, they were planning this off the off chance that it was a hit, uh, and they only ever got as far as like concept art and the rough idea of what it might be but that's pretty much all there is so people getting excited on different forums on internet and sites it's, it, it, it wasn't going to happen I'm afraid guys uh, but I'd say Team 17 themselves what they went on to become off the back of a, a, a game like this and looking at the rest of the Team 17 library it's, it seems this is just a weird side game it wasn't the sort of stuff that they would usually do so I wasn't sure why they went down that route if anybody means knows then by all means get in touch with me lefariousatamigarama.com because I'm actually interested I want to know now, to delve into the game a bit deeper, uh, the game story is uh, pretty, pretty brief from what I could find out in the manual. Uh, when you first start the game, it shows a picture of uh, uh, sprawling fields and houses like out in a village and stuff, and you get what feels like about half an hour of scrolling text. But when you look at the manual, unless I was just looking at a re-release or something, I mean, you get a paragraph, and it basically goes... 
It was the same old story. The evil Prince Gallus slew his brother Kale to gain the kingdom. Now only Cho, boyhood friend of Kale, stood in his way. This was Cho's chance for adventure, his chance to prove his worth. He couldn't wait for Gallus to seek him out. Instead, he would take the fight to Gallus and end the threat to the Sperris land forever. Now, when you first start the game, you go off to uh, meet the king. This has actually changed, because that's not what the story is at all, because the main character doesn't seem all that bothered and doesn't seem too fussed. And it's very, very strange. The story in the manual doesn't really seem to match what's in the actual game. Now, I did say before that this was a bit of a Zelda clone. It certainly is in look and style and, and, and generally how it plays. So, I mean, I'm not really describing the graphics there very well, but one of the biggest pluses for this is that the graphics, they're nice, they're bright, they're colourful, they are fairly well drawn, and there's some parts where you look at it, like in some of the trees and the bushes and stuff, and you think, yeah, that's definitely like that uh, Zelda style, and it, it's also very similar to like the 16-bit Final Fantasy games. Now, the, the other side to that is a lot of the assets are reused all over. Now, usually something like that might be a problem, but it, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big world, I mean, so it, it is quite quite forgivable and uh, one of the good things about it you, you do get uh, support for two buttons on a joystick I mean god I mean, I'm getting excited about that but it was the end of the Amiga's life uh, and it does seem to have a specific control set for the CD32 pads I'm not sure if they'd planned that already with the AGA version but yeah I, I'd only had a brief look at that on the emulator but it seemed to work in time with it now as I said the map is huge uh, uh, there's eight areas to, to go through and those are sorry more like levels and areas but uh, you've got caves uh, fields uh, ruins uh, uh, rivers you know it's all pretty well drawn out in that uh, in that graphical st that Zelda style works quite well you do only have two items at the top of the screen uh, there's HP or, or vitality bar uh, when you fill the uh, experience uh, uh, bar underneath or EXP it, it basically eventually after killing so many enemies it just increases the size of the vitality so there's that little light bit of uh, uh, RPG element there though it's not like say Zelda is with, with the heart so it is a bit different uh, the thing with the two items again that matches the original Legend of Zelda I, I just think I can't remember if the SNES one had more than two I don't think it, I can remember it's been years and years since I've played that now it's your typical fantasy fair instead of coins or gold you've got gems which represent currency uh, lots of weapons to find throughout dungeons uh, bombs you know typical stuff that you get in Zelda which you know you used to blow holes in walls things like that uh, I think is because they reuse the assets a fair bit a lot of the stuff in the walls aren't that easy to work out or where it's supposed to be now one of the good things I did quite like about it especially when you're walking around towns or areas that if you stay Stand in front of, say, a, an object or, or a person, you'll get like a, a, a little icon appears above your, your character's head. Now, if it's a person, it's like a chat icon. If it's an object, it's a couple of eyes. And you can basically press a, a button uh, and it'll bring up a prompt and either explain, I'll let you do something with it. Now, at the time, I don't think any or well, many games even were, were, were doing that. I certainly don't remember. It wasn't in the likes of uh, uh, Zelda or any of that, those Final Fantasy adventure type games. And it, it's just a neat little fix at least, which helps whilst you're playing the game. Hidden all over the world and out in plain sight, actually, is lots and lots, lots of uh, your typical tre uh, treasure chests, uh, and they contain like like hidden items. And again, it's a, this is it is a Zelda clone, so it's that sort of stuff. Now, a lot of the items are very, very similar, a bit cheeky, actually. I mean, things like uh, shovels. A wand, uh, uh, like gloves, uh, speed boots. I mean, that's ripped straight out of the Zelda. I mean, it does have some of its own twists on things as you get further and further on in the game, but it is a bit cheeky. <laughs> now, one of the things I really did love about this is there is some absolutely fantastic music playing throughout. I mean, it, it, it fits each of the areas very, very well, and it's not just your typical fantasy pair. It, it, it kind of, it's like it really mixes in well with the areas that you're in, and, and as as I was listening to it, I kept thinking in a lot of cases that the music was better than the game, but, you know, what can you do? What can you do? Uh, another great side to it is the sound effects. Now, 
pretty much whatever you do, whatever you touch, makes a noise, walking around, like everything reacts really, really well. And, and I was surprised at just how much depth these sound effects actually gave it. Because with a lot of the Ami games, you might have some very, very simple things going on. But probably the biggest thing that I really, really liked was the, the menu sound when you're just clicking across. Again, it reminded me of Zelda. So maybe that's why uh, there wasn't any like uh, the Zelda-like theme when you opened a chest, by the way. But maybe that would have been a big improvement. Uh, you might be thinking, well, what's the combat like? When you use like the main weapons and stuff, it, it, it's very, very simple. You just walk towards an em enemy and start firing. It's the same if you, you know, swinging your sword. Uh, sword's one of the earliest weapons you pick up. Like I said, later on, you get things like wands and stuff and stuff you can throw. So the range attacks aren't really much. It, again, it reminds me of when you're in Zelda, you hold down the, the sword button, it charges it and it slings or it fires the blades to war and it's that sort of thing. Yes, there is a, a flaming blade. I don't know what, what's probably the best thing to call it, but a glowing blade that you can swing across the map at your enemies. Again, that's a bit cheeky and pinching a lot off Zelda. All I keep saying is Zelda, 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 but it's too much of a clone not to drag this in and compare the two. So, you know, it, it's well deserved to keep saying. Now we have to get to that part of the podcast where we start picking at the problems and seeing what's wrong with it. And usually there's a good balance between uh, both sides on a game. But with this one, there's, there's, I've got a list in front of me of just notes generally to go along with. And my God, is it massive. Uh, now, again, I'm not jumping to the conclusion already. But one of my biggest problems with this straight away is, I mean, even playing it right from the off, is it's off, it's too easy to get stuck. One of the best examples of this is right from the start of the game, which annoyed me no end. I went, you're in a big city area, so you, you wake up, you come out of your house. I mean, it's not like Zelda where you're off down south from the, the, the main castle and then have to wander up. There's none of that. You're basically straight in the city. You come outside, you wander around a bit. You have to go and see the king for the opening story. Uh, and, and then you have to go and find a weapon before you can go outside. Now, I wandered around the town, from, oh, town thinking, well, where the hell is this weapon? And I kept talking to people. And then just by chance, I was up right against the uh, uh, the west wall. And this guy said to, uh, oh, yeah, there's a sword around here. Well, I'd been in all the surrounding buildings where we were. And if you think of the town with the castle in the middle and then, you know, a, a left side and a right side. And, and I'm in the left side, so I spent ages wandering up and down and trying to get in things and wondering where the hell it could be and then out of about 10 minutes of frustration I just wandered over to the right and then I started searching other buildings and and it was just by chance really but I was I met another guy who said that I think he said like like the sword was hidden or something it was a really rubbish hint uh, and I, I just walked along this castle wall and just went in left and I ended up in this room and and it was there and, and, you know, you're in the area to the side and it's just like, well, that's not explained our point. There's not like a path leading straight and it's not visually available. But I'd spent ages wandering around and as I started progressing with the game, them sort of problems uh, were all over. The hints are absolutely awful. You get very, very brief things, like very general. And, and especially when an area like that is so big and, and it doesn't get any better as you're going through the game. And you just it, it just frustrated me no end. What, what can I say? I mean, maybe it's just how they were trying to expand the game at the time, but it, it doesn't do itself any favours. They could have made it much, much easier to start off with. I mean, for God's sake, you start in the guy's house. You could have just stuck the sword in the cupboard. I'd have been happy with that. And then I could have gone off and done some combat. This also leads on to another problem I had with the characters in general. Because you can go up to them and they will talk. But a lot of them talk for forever and a day. And, and, and it's like, it just it feels like paragraph after paragraph of text. But the thing is, the text is not very good. They the over-describe everything, a bit like me, actually, with this podcast. Uh, but they go way overboard. And, and some things you just look at and you just think that could have been done in like a line of text or a, a lot less. So you end up over-reading things for very, very simple clues. And then the clues aren't always great in the first place. And, and it, it just annoys you. I mean, especially when you know, I'm talking to a person, they give you like a full reaming paragraph of text for something. And you just think... Well, why? What's the point? 
Uh, now, wandering around the uh, the environments as well. This is sort of, this is a bad thing, I suppose. But it's not. It's not for this type of game. It's just as average. I mean, you can destroy like parts of the the scenery or, or the surround, and and as you get stuff later on, the game expands. You know, you get bombs and things to open up walls and stuff. And a lot of the well, some of the things in the scenery is destroyable. But the problem is. There's no visual difference. Like, like the perfect example in the opening town. If you walk down to the south, there's a, there's a section you can destroy and go through. But that section looks the same as every other section along that wall. And it doesn't matter where you are or what it is to get through. It always looks the same. There's no... It's not like there's a little crack in the wall or anything like that. It doesn't break it down enough to give you a clue. Now, I didn't actually try. I never thought this time, but like in Zelda, you'd walk up to a wall and if you knock on it with your sword, it would make a, a different sound. And I'm pretty sure I don't remember anything like that in the game. But again, it's it's an obvious clue that they could have used. Um, now, the other thing is the game, you know, it's absolutely huge. It's a big sprawling world and stuff with all these different areas, which is great. But the problem is... There's very little for you actually to do beyond the actual main points of, of going somewhere and opening the chest or collecting an item. You're not interacting with stuff. You know, there's not lots of different types of puzzles that you're doing to, to solve stuff. Again, again, it's not like a Zelda game in that sense at all. And it really could have done with that too, to flesh it out a bit. Now, one of the funniest things that I noticed is is the graphics on the hero are a bit weird. He looks very, very fat for what he actually is. You know, he's supposed to be running around swinging swords and weapons and stuff, and he's huge. Uh, uh, I think the main, the, a lot of the characters are like that. Maybe it was just my TV. Uh, but this is Taz, you know, when you create a fantasy world like this, and this is the perfect example because the story in this is awful i mean it, it's truly even in my notes i've, I've like like book awful in big capital letters and underscored it because it's dreadful that opening scroll when you first when you first read it i mean it's just like on and on and on paragraph after paragraph and then it's just so unnecessary i mean even the story in the manual doesn't match really what's going on in the game and, and it just it feels like somebody needed to re rewrite it. I mean, that, that over again, that opening scroll, it was so, so wrong. Uh, another issue I did have, a lot of the puzzles are very disjointed. I mean, the solutions don't always make sense for what you're supposed to do. And a lot of it is just simple, like, like go from A to B. But again, I just even with the opening... So it should just be a lot more simpler and more straightforward than what it actually is. Now, it is a pretty big world, and I do like that about it in a way, because it, it is that action RPG. But a lot of these areas, because of what you're doing, there's an awful lot of backtracking, and you have to try and figure out where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. And the hints, as I've said, they're, just, they're not there. They, they don't support you as a player in the game. Oh, it reminds me of something like... Uh, 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 Castlevania 2, you know, the Simon's Quest game where they give you like random hints which don't really make any sense. And though it's not that odd or off, it just sometimes the general clues it gives you, it, it really just needed passing over again. One of its biggest issues is you, you, know, you can pick up all these different weapons and you think these should be nice and straightforward and you compare it to a Zelda game and when you pick some up you get like a bit of a mini tutorial or it gives you some clues and tells you how to use it or it gives you uh, examples of puzzles to use in, in a very clever and guiding way and there's nothing like that here. You just get left with an item or something and then you're just supposed to figure out what it does and how it works and it just feels... Again, it's disjointed, it just feels off. And when you've got this huge, big, sprawling world, it's, you might think, oh, well, it's like in a Zelda, you know, you go from one part of the map to the other and wander about. But the thing is, these areas are absolutely huge. It's wandering after wandering after wandering, and a lot of it just feels completely pointless. I mean, one of the other biggest things I had with it is, is the amount of spelling mistakes. And this is why it needed rewriting. I don't know what was going on at Team 17 at the time, but... 
it's littered with spelling mistakes and and not just like a little bit of grammar. Really, it's like something like what they produced in Japan and then transferred over to England. And it was probably just because they just didn't have like a proper writing team. And uh, I thought that explains that why these big games like on the 16-bit systems even they would have somebody go. No, no, they didn't because they were just as bad. Because you could get just a worse game from the likes of Square or Enix or whatever at the time. So I don't know what was going through these companies' minds back in the mid 90s when it comes to doing like proper RPG text because it's just terrible but then maybe that's carrying on a bit of a tradition with these type of games with a bad text <laughs> the magazines of the time weren't exactly too kind to this uh, well again, Amiga format gave it 82% uh, then again, that was for the CD32 edition they actually gave the disc version 69% my god I wonder what happened there uh, Amiga magazine gave it 6 out of 10 uh, Amiga Power gave it 50%, CU Amiga gave it 74%, and when you start reading, reading the reviews and then digging into it, they pretty much picked up on a lot of what I've been saying as well, but they weren't very impressed with it, and, and I think it, they felt it was lacking as well. I mean, this this is a it's a Zelda clone. When, when you're going up against something like that against Nintendo, even with a small team like that, they clearly had that sort of a game in mind, but... I don't know, they, they really just didn't try hard enough because it's certainly not on the same le level. I mean, there's just, there's too many little niggles going on throughout it. I mean, there's loads and loads of, of good points and it, it, it's an expansive world and it's got a lot going on to, to a certain degree, but it hasn't got enough to make it anything but frustrating. There's just far too many little niggles. Uh, but that's the disappointing thing about it, because I just felt as I was playing there, I mean, there was some enjoyment there. I could see past a lot of the problems. I mean, it was quite well thought out, I thought, but it just needed that, well, not a little bit tweaking. Let's not be wrong here. This is not an amazing game by any means, but they had the backbone for something special. That's what's so disappointing about it. If they could have just tweaked some of the areas or maybe sat down there a bit longer with, with a Super Nintendo and just dug into Zelda a bit more and come away with some better ideas. I mean, again, the game was made. A lot of this stuff could just have been changed very, very easily. It's like with the text or with the puzzles or... or the way it all works and, and the way the player it's, it's, it's what you call it. it's like that human interaction level it's just missing that it's just not all the way there and it just needed that little bit more work and i mean it's a fantastic looking world but there's just nothing within the game that takes advantage of it i mean it's great they can go into a house or a castle or some ruins and stuff like that and all you really find at the end of it all is just chests and i know zelda's in the early days were a bit guilty with that but they would mix it up a bit there was much more to the world than going on than this is that going on with it it's just very very disappointing and and i have to say it again i've even got it scrolled a second time in notes saying oh that story is so so bad i can't believe anybody sat there at the beginning during the development stage and just thought yeah this is okay it'll be all right no one will notice but you they will this is an action rpg the story is one of the most important parts and again if you you're gonna rip off that opening off zelda and they have done it because there's no way you can have the main character sleep sleeping in a house on his own to wake up to then go on to a castle that's zelda to a t so they've played it they know they know what's coming on but the great thing about that is if you look at it on the super nintendo in that opening moments like the, there's low like music and it's raining outside and it draws you down and it get, link gets waking up by uh, zelda speaking to him and then it it just drags on and you know as you go outside there's a little bit of an adventure there until you pick the weapon up it's just it's it, it's intuitive and it guides you along and it's a bit like a tutorial this has just got nothing it's just like oh you have to find the person who can tell you where your weapon is he's up there somewhere i found him and he's like oh yeah it's definitely around here somewhere and then i have to spend 10 or 15 minutes once searching every building and every rock and everything trying to find this weapon that is not intuitive and uh, and another side to that is i forgot to mention you cannot leave the opening bit without having found a weapon because it throws you out and just says, oh yeah, you've not got a way to defend yourself from the monsters. And you think, all right, fantastic. So what do I do? And I ended up circling area after area, try, try to work it all out. Very, very disappointing. It just seems that 
every good thing it manages to achieve. It just has like a, a bad thing to knock it off with. It doesn't matter what area you're in because the niggles just keep annoying you and frustrating. And and I, I'm so, I'm just annoyed with it because again, there's almost a fantastic game there. It's so close. I mean, it's the sort of thing... Surely there's somebody in like the Amiga scene who would be tempted to go back and reprogram or make some changes to something like this because we're just that few more changes we could put maybe call it Sperris Legacy the the legend or something or, or or the ongoing quest or the return or something crazy like that it it's there's there's a good backbone there but it just doesn't do anywhere near enough to be anything special and like i say overall oh, i was just really really disappointed with it except for the music i really enjoyed the music <laughs> So yeah, what a time to finish. I'm quite frustrated even talking back over it. I'm still getting annoyed thinking back on the, on, on the odd moment. Oh, it's not what I'm going to go back to, I'm afraid. I, 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 don't, I don't know. What can I say? What can I say? Let, let's, let's call it a day there, guys. I will upload some gameplay footage alongside the podcast on AmigaArmor.com. I suggest you come and watch it because, again, this is a missed opportunity and I'd like to show it off, guys. Until then, I will see you next week.